holy Lord God Almighty all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea holy 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 merciful and mighty god in three persons blessed trinity amen thank you you may be seated Born September 23, 1948, Richard was adopted at birth by Seaborn and Myrtle Duncan. His mother had the pick of several babies, but fell in love with the little boy with the big brown eyes. When in grade school, a Presbyterian church needed children for their children's choir. He was introduced to the great music of the church through this choir and to the idea of God. When he was 13, his father passed away to a heart attack. The following day, the family was at home when there was a knock at the door. A young man was doing door-to-door -door ministry and wanted to speak with them. When he was told of Seaborn's passing, he asked if he could come in and share scripture with them. They agreed, and he read scripture and prayed with them. Myrtle had no idea what she could do, so she moved to Deland, Florida. She was doing some shopping when she saw an advertisement for a flower arranging class and decided to attend. When she arrived, she discovered in that same class a cousin she had lost touch with years before. Her cousin, learning of the situation from Myrtle and her son, ministered to her and invited them to church at the Alliance Chapel in the land. They went, and the first Sunday was the installation for the new pastor, Joe Beck. Several pastors from the area took part. To Myrtle's amazement, one of them was the same young man who visited them and prayed for them. The following Sunday, Palm Sunday, in the evening service, Richard gave his heart to the Lord, and he always considered Palm Sunday his special spiritual birthday. When the school year ended, they moved back to Hialeah, Florida. They were given direction to First Alliance Church in downtown Miami and attended where they were warmly welcomed. They were told, however, there was an Alliance Church closer to where they lived. The next Sunday, they walked the two blocks to that church where they were again warmly welcomed. The church was excited as it was the first Sunday for their new pastor. When Myrtle saw him, she was amazed again as it was the same man who had visited them when Seaborn passed and at the service in the land. That man's name was Ron Mayers. Ron took Richard under his wing and mentored him. He taught him how to study God's Word. When Richard graduated high school, he enrolled in his pastor's alma mater, Tocoa Falls Bible College in Tocoa, Georgia. This was where one Jane Francis Ellis was already a student. Richard graduated in 1970 and returned to Hialeah as assistant pastor. He was ordained in 1972. He served as pastor of the Alliance Church in Callahan, Florida before moving to Baytown, Texas, where he served as a youth pastor. In October 1976, Jane Ellis took part in a mission trip to Ecuador. While away, Richard took care of her parents' house. The evening before she left, they went out to dinner, and he gave her a corsage of red roses. Oh, Don Juan Richard, they're looking. Huh? <laughs> Returning home from Ecuador, Richard was still at the house and took her out for a snack. As he was leaving to go home, he said there was food in the fridge and would make her dinner the next day. They began dating, and by Thanksgiving were engaged, and on April 30th, 1977, they were married. In 1978, Rachel joined the family. They moved to Sylacauga, Alabama, and ministered there for a few years. Robert joined the family in 1980 after moving to Jacksonville, Florida. Richard enrolled at Luther Rice Seminary and earned a Master's of Divinity. While there, he found Atlantic Boulevard Baptist Church, ministering there while in seminary. After graduating, he began attending at Arlington Alliance Church. Today, it's Hope Community Church. He was teaching Sunday school and leading worship and music. Richard was offered the pastorship of the Alliance Church in St. Augustine in 1999, which met at the Little White Church on Wildwood Drive. He ministered there until health issues forced his retirement. The Duncans began looking for a church where the teaching was similar to how Richard preached, expository and books at a time. 
He found that, me, he enjoyed the fellowship and teaching at his church. I'm going to interrupt this for a moment. Uh, Richard was, uh, I wish if there's somehow or another I could just have his mind. He was brilliant. Uh, he was a, an incredible uh, theologian. Um, he was well-read and well-versed. But he had the ability that when he read something, he got it. I have the ability to read something and lose it. So that's, that's it. But he had, he had an incredible mind. He was, he was so gifted. And, uh, and I've told him numerous times, and I've told you before, I said he, he would always give me these books that just tortured me. You know, Octavius Winslow and on and on and on. R.C. Ryle, he just kept, kept, he said, I want you to read this. I said, man, you, you're killing me. You know, no, no, this is good stuff. Makes you think, makes you think. I think that's the problem. <laughs> I get tired fast. Richard loved his God and Savior. He loved God's Word. In the early morning hours of April 7th this year, Jesus took Richard by the hand and led him home to be presented faultless before the Father with great joy. Richard Duncan had a wonderful life and is now experiencing a wonderful eternity. God be the glory and his grace. Amen. All right. Dennis. I mean, a tremendous story, and we do have a great story to tell about a loving God who died for us. I love to tell the story, hymn number 444. 444. We'll sing the first, the third, and the last. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longing as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Verse number three, I love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat. What seems each time I tell it, more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never heard a message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. See hungering and thirsty to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, twill be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and His love. Amen. 
Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for coming on behalf of the family. We deeply appreciate it. Richard Duncan is my father. I say is because of the promises found in Scripture. Matthew chapter 22, verses 32 and 33. I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Yes. This promise is repeated in Mark chapter 12, verses 25 to 27, and Luke chapter 20, verses 38. God has promised an amazing eternity to his children. This promise my father believed in on earth, and is now seen firsthand. The promises of God were the foundation of my father's life. Growing up, we were always in church, and our lives revolved around the church. I was born in Jacksonville, and soon after, Dad ministered temporarily as a fill-in pastor of an independent church in Cocoa Beach. This was fortunate as we were there for the first launch of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Dad loved it, however, I slept through it. <laughs> Dad wanted Rachel and I to have a strong biblical foundation, so while in seminary, he found the San Pablo Christian Academy, and I started kindergarten there and stayed there until third grade. While there, after a Friday chapel service, I went forward and prayed with Pastor Mark to receive Christ. Putting me in this private school for four years was a sacrifice for my parents I appreciate to this day. We began attending Arlington Alliance Church and stayed there until 1999, when Dad became pastor of the Alliance Church in St. Augustine. During the time at Arlington Alliance, the church changed a lot, including its name, and Dad was there for all of it. The church sold the property to a Baptist church looking for a home, the church then rented a storefront while waiting for the sale of the new property to go through and the new building to be built. I remember my mom driving Rachel and I over to the property to visit my dad and grandfather. They were there along with the other men in the church building the new building. And after the building was finished and services started, dad taught Sunday school and led music. Dad is my father. He taught God's word to the church, but to Rachel and I, he was our father. When I was a lot younger, he took me to the barber get used to the idea of having a haircut. I've gotten a little bit better about it. <laughs> One day, a young boy was getting his haircut, and you couldn't miss him as he was crying and wailing loudly. Dad leaned over, looked right at me, and said, you will not do that. <laughs> I said, the only thing you can say in that situation, yes, sir. Message received and understood, and I did not act up when it was my turn. Dad and Mom were present in our schooling, helped us with our homework, drove us to and from school when they could. I attended school in Jacksonville while Rachel attended Florida School for the Deaf and the Blind here in St. Augustine. We made the trip quite a bit to visit her, especially on her birthday. <laughs> Dad and Mom were proud when we both graduated from high school, and they were proud when I decided to attend their alma mater to Hill Falls College. They visited us as often as they could, and Dad was very proud when I graduated. In 2008, during the economic downturn, I moved back to St. Augustine. God kept shutting door after door for, my, for employment, so in 2010, when Dad went into the hospital, I was here to help Mom. After Dad came home, it was my turn to help him, driving him to rehab, doctor visits, and errands. During these years, the love for the Lord was very evident. He would often sit in the living room with the TV on, but paying it no attention. He would instead be reading scripture, a book about scripture, a book about a man of God who preached scripture. It always came back to scripture. There was a deep love for God's word. He filled in teaching Sunday school and preaching when he could as he loved to share God's word with others. Pastor David can tell you how much as Dad gave him a number of books on the subject, especially by Octavius Winslow. My father passed away due to this pandemic of COVID-19. When we were driving back from the hospital, a lot was going through my mind. What sticks out is how to explain this to those without Christ. A person without Christ might see this as a random chance, bad luck, karma, ultimately meaningless. My father would never see it that way. Psalm 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Yes. This is God's world. Yes. And there is nothing random or meaningless in it. The events of my dad's life on earth were all planned out. From his death to his graduation to glory and everything in between. The death of his father led him to the Alliance Chapel in Deland, Florida, where he found Christ. Led him to Ron Mayers, who mentored him, who led him to Tacoa, which led him to my mom, which led to my sister and I. God's plan, indeed, led all the way here. My father's first prayer in the days after his father's death 
seeing the massive grief of his mother was very simple. Just two words. God help. God heard, massively answered, and made a difference in my father's life, here on earth and for eternity. God can make that same difference in your life as well. Please let him. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Victory in Jesus, hymn number 353. Hymn 353, if you'll join me by standing, and we'll sing all three verses. save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning then I repented of my sin and won the victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood i heard about his healing of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again being caused the blind to see and then i cried dear jesus and hope a broken spirit and somehow jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood on the last i heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory and i heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood amen be seated please thinking about brother richard and his love for the lord and just uh, the last 10 or plus years that he has just had some ill health but it still did not stop him in his search for knowledge and sharing so uh, tonight I want to come from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18 it's it's the title real faith but it talks about especially in verse 17 for our light affliction which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory so let me read verses 13 through 18. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, that's out of the Psalms, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. 
Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Praise God. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pause just for a moment for a word of prayer. Our Father, now we ask. In Jesus' name, that God, you would give us clarity of thought and mind. I pray, Lord, for these who will hear this message. I pray, Lord, that it would penetrate their heart. Spirit of God, take the word of God, and you do that. You tell us that your word will not return void. And, Lord, it's not that we're counting on that. It's that we know that. So, our Father, we ask tonight that this word would be a a time of encouragement and a time of challenge. And, Lord, it would also be a testimony of the faith of Richard Hudson Duncan and what he believed in. And because of that, Lord, he's with you in the very presence of Almighty God as we speak. So, Lord, I pray there'd be one here tonight who's never been saved. Lord, they may have been a church member. They may have done some church work. Lord, they may know Scripture. They may know a lot of things. But, Lord, the question is, do they know the Lord Jesus Christ? And our prayer tonight is, Lord, that they would come to know Christ as their personal Savior. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. In our text tonight, and it starts in verse 7, that's the paragraph, we find the Apostle Paul sharing with us how to find comfort in the midst of suffering. In the midst of suffering. And the amazing thing is, you look at our world today, we see suffering all around us. It's everywhere. I mean, you don't have to go far. Uh, in our church, uh, in our church family, outside of these four walls, uh, you know, this, this past week I have a sister who had back surgery. I have a brother that's uh, had a liver transplant. He's in Dallas, and they're doing all kinds of things. So uh, suffering is everywhere. And that could be physical. It could be mental. It could be spiritual. But suffering is all about us. Chuck Swindoll said this years ago, someone has said that God's megaphone is sometimes called pain. And that sounds odd because God's a God of love. Why would, he, why would God use a, a megaphone, and why would he call it pain? Well, sometimes, for those of us who are stubborn, God has to speak a little bit louder so that we can get what he's trying to tell us. And sometimes, when we are in pain, we're going through something, it's amazing how that all of a sudden, what happens? We sort of circle back and we come back to where? We come back to where God is. We come back to our faith. And we start asking those questions. Lord, why and how come? And and Lord, what is it that you need me to do? Lord, what are you trying to teach me? We ask those, those hard questions. So sometimes... Pain is God's megaphone to get our attention. But pain being defined as it affects each individual person. Everybody has a different threshold of pain. For example, being misunderstood may be devastating to someone who can tolerate physical pain without any problem at all. But in our text, it helps us to understand that suffering and persecution, whether it comes physically, spiritually, or mentally, Warren Wiersbe calls these verses, he calls them faith builders. You say, Well, why is that? Look again in verse 17. There's a word right in the middle of that verse that should grab our attention. He says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment compared to eternity, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So you measure it out, you weigh it out. Suffering that we, that we endure in this life is only for a moment compared to eternity. And then it, you measure that out with the eternal weight of glory that one day we're going to inherit and be involved in. There's not even a comparison to it. But now here's some things we need to understand. We may have the idea that God rewards us for our faith, but we do not earn anything by faith. Do you understand that? Say, I have great faith. I have no faith. I have little faith. I'm losing my faith. But we have this idea that God rewards us for our faith. But ladies and gentlemen, you do not earn anything by faith. Now that sounds odd, but listen. Some define faith as obeying God. Some define faith as elite. But tonight it's my goal to help each of you to define and find out what real faith is all about. You see, because this is why. It's part of Satan's program to make our faith and practice complicated and involved. We have the idea that God rewards us for our faith, but we do not earn anything by faith. I I need to say that again. 
God rewards us for our faith. He did reward you for your faith that he gave you. You remember when you were saved? God gave you all the ingredients that you needed in order to become a follower of Christ. Because we were dead in our trespasses and sin, we were dead. But God comes with his amazing grace, and wrapped up in that grace is the person of Christ that we put our faith in. And you go to Galatians 2.22, it's, it's by the faith of the Son of God. God gives us that faith. Faith is a gift that God gives us. Now, did you earn that? Absolutely not. That's because it was grace. God gave that to you. So what does Satan want to do? He wants to make our faith and practicing our faith complicated and involved. Now listen carefully. We have the idea that God rewards us for our faith. Again, but we do not earn anything by faith. God brings us into a right relationship with God. Faith brings us into a right relationship. And it gives God his opportunity to work in us. That's what faith does. God gives us faith. All right, we're introduced. We have a relationship with God. We're trusting in God. We're looking to God. And because of that inroad that God, because he's given us that gift of faith, then what happens is God has now opportunity to work in our lives through faith. And what is faith? Trusting God. Believing in God. Abraham. God called Abraham. What did Abraham do? He left there of the Chaldees. He goes to a land he'd never seen, never heard of. And when he gets there, God says, I'm going to make, you're going to have children and children and children. He said, that you can't even count them because he said, like the sands of the seas are the stars of the sky. Now the Bible says that Abraham believed God and what did God do? God justified him. Did Abraham do anything? No, he just trusted God. But now here comes the thing. When did we see Abraham's faith in action? What was the fruit of Abraham's faith? When Abraham took Isaac in Genesis 22, when he took him up on the mount and he was going to offer him as a sacrifice. Now the world would say, that is a horrible thing. I mean, that is, that is bad as the pagans. That's what Molech and all these... No, 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 no. Uh-uh. You see, because you have to understand the belief and the trust that Abraham had in God. What was that? Because God had given him the promise... Abraham trusted God, that God was going to keep his word, that God does not lie. And so he knew that if he obeyed God and did exactly what God told him to do by offering up his son Isaac, he knew and he trusted that God had the power and the strength to do what? To resurrect him so that God could keep his promise. See, Abraham did not have God in a box. And that's what Satan wants to do. That's why he comes and he attacks our faith. God frequently, and this is Oswald Chambers, God frequently has to knock the bottom board out of your experience in order to get you back to the basics, your dependency on God. You have faith to do something. You have faith that this is going to happen. And then it doesn't happen. What happens? Well, then guess what? That's Satan's program. So he wants to get you, he wants to make your faith complicated and he wants to make it so involved. Many have no faith, listen, many have no faith in God at all, but only faith in what God has done for you. Listen. And when these things are not evident, you lose your faith and you say things like, why should this happen to me? I've been good. I've been faithful. I've been serving God. Why are these bad things, negative things happening to me? See, the problem is because, again, part of Satan's program, you are living off of good, positive, feel-good experiences. And your faith is what you are doing and what you have done. And if you get wrapped up in that, when something bad happens, what happens? You lose your faith. Not in God. But not, not the faith that God gave you, but you lose your faith in your experience. So you've had a, how many times have you heard this? I had a bad experience, that's why I don't go to church. You know why I don't have any here? Because I pull it out when I hear that. And I got a little bit left. But it, it's amazing though. Because of this, we take our faith for granted. And what we take for granted, we never take seriously. Faith means I commit myself to Jesus. Placing myself absolutely on him, sink or swim, and you do both. This is Wearsby. You sink unto yourself and you swim to him. Remember, a Christian does not have to live. He only has to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ until the very end. Four things, real quick. First of all, look in verse 13. You have to have faith in the right person. And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is believed what is written I believe and therefore I speak we also believe and therefore speak chambers again most of us are pagans in a crisis listen to what he's saying now, he wrote this back in the early 1900s most of us are pagans in a crisis we think and act like pagans only one in a hundred is daring enough to bank his faith in the character of God 
Ask Job. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he, God, slay me, yet I am going to trust God. Because God knows what he's doing. That's faith. Your faith is only as strong as the person that you put your faith in. Paul here in verse 13, he's quoting Psalm 116 verse 10. But the cross reference is back in Romans 10.10. 10. Listen to what it says. You know these verses. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness... And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So what we believe in here, we speak it. That's what he's talking about in verse 13. God sees the quality of your faith when you believe. Man sees the reality of your faith through your works. We've been studying in the book of James. He said, I'll show you my faith without my works, but I'll show you my faith by my works. The result or cause of believing is faith. The effect or fruit of faith is worse. Again, Abraham is our illustration. Secondly, faith never knows where it is being led. It knows and loves the one who is leading. Did you hear that? Faith never knows where it is being led. It knows and loves the one who is leading. It is a life of faith and not of intelligence and reason, but a life of knowing who is making me go. Abraham had faith in God even though he could see better things in which to have faith in. In other words, Abraham, he was happy in the early Chaldees. He probably had a business. He had a family. He had family. I mean, he was doing fine. He was worshiping the moon. But yet he was, he was fine where he was. But yet something happened when God called him. Believe steadfastly on him, and all you come up against will develop our faith. That's what verse 17 says. He said, our, for our light affliction is but for a moment. It is working for us. It is working for us. So my question is, who are you putting your faith in? Your experiences or God? The second faith builder is, you've got to believe in the right promise. Look at verse 14. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. The right promise. I use this many times, but until a person is prepared to die, he is not really prepared to live. Does that make sense? Until a person is prepared to die, he's not really prepared to live. If you're not ready, if you're not made preparation for death, in other words, I know where I'm going to spend eternity. I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep me against that day. So I know that. And so because that fact is settled, I can live my life. Knowing that if anything happens to me, going on mission trips, doing anything like that, uh, hang gliding, uh, don't do that. But <laughs> in Darm Solid, that's a whole other world. But I know whom I have believed in. And so I have perfect peace. And, and I strive every day to stay in the center of his will for my life. And so I can live my life to the fullest. As the unbeliever, death is the great divider. For, but for believers, it's the great uniter. Um, I, I think about over in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, some of my, my favorite scripture, and I, I love to quote it. But when, when Paul was writing this, uh, in verse 16, he says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, Brother Richard's got a, he's got a head start on us. Some others in our church fellowship have got a head start on us because their bodies are coming up out of the grave because when the Lord comes, this is not the second coming, this is the rapture. He's going to stop in the clouds according to the scriptures. Second coming is when he comes back to the earth. Here he's talking about, and also in 1 Corinthians 15, he's going to stop in the clouds and he's bringing them with him, those who have gone on before us. Those who, absent from the body, as Brother Harry said, are present with the Lord. So the Lord's going to bring them with him. They're going to stop in the clouds. They're spirits. And then their bodies are going to caught, get caught up. And then they're going to be, I mean, you can see millions of this. All of a sudden, instantaneously glorified bodies. Boom! There. In the clouds. So how God, how's he going to do that? I don't know and I don't care. I just know he's going to do it. I'm not going to sit, live, sit in a dark room until I figure out how electricity works. I'm going to turn the light on and enjoy it. So the Lord's going to do that. Then, watch, listen to 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together, listen, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. 
Verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So what promise are you putting your faith in? Do you have a hope so salvation, a hope so faith, or a no so? The third faith builder is the right purpose. Back to our text in verse 15. It says, listen to the purpose. For all things are for your sakes. That grace, having spread through the many, through the lives of many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. You know, when we get to heaven, those of us who know Jesus, when we get there, do you understand, it's not going to be about us. Hey, good to see you. Glad you're here. Glad you made it. Oh, you know, and, we're going, and some of them are going to say, what are you doing here? I mean, you, know, <laughs> I'm, you got in? You know, <laughs> I'll be in season. But when we get to heaven, you know, you're going to have this, you know, millions and millions, and, and over in Revelation it talks about it, it there's going to be this roar because it, it's going to be a sea of people. Now, when, when, when you see that, and we're going to be a part of that, but it's not going to be about us. It's going to be about the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of all of us. And I'm telling you folks, when... And I, I know the Lord's going to come in the clouds. He's going to take us home. That is going to be incredible. But when we have that gathering of the church, and when the Lord Jesus steps out, I mean eternity is going to just burst with praises of thanksgiving. Now look at verse 15. Why is that? It's going to cause thanksgiving to abound to the what? To the glory of God. But notice what happens. For all things for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many, for all things for your sakes. All things. What is that? All things that are good or bad. This goes back to Romans 8, 28. All things for your sake. Look what it says. That grace having spread through the many people. There's grace in this room tonight. You, you want to know how, how complicated God's grace is? How, how we misunderstand God's grace? Today, Brother Dennis needed grace. I had no idea what went on in his life today. Today and tonight, Miss Jane, she's experiencing God's grace. And others in here, not you, you, you experienced a measure of God's grace today. And, and, and some, well, the thing is, it's, God says, okay, I only got one cup. You got to drink from it. Orange juice is our juice. Not God's grace. God's grace meets us at our point of need. And remember what grace is. Grace is unmerited favor. God comes with mercy, which we don't get what we deserve. We get what we need. And God wraps it up in grace. And, and grace is what you get love and joy and peace and forgiveness. And all of those. And God comes. And whatever your need is there, God is spreading his grace through all of our many needs for the glory of God. Now, to be honest, sometimes, you know, we're just sort of right here. This is all we can see. But when we get to heaven... And we see that wave of people and we're going to have perfect knowledge and we're going to be able to look around and we're going to see how God saved this person out of that kind of life. God did this miracle in their life. God did this. He did this and this. And you're going to see all that. And all we can say is glory to God. Yes, hallelujah. His glory to God for his amazing grace. Grace. So the guy that I said, how, how did you get in here? He's going to say Grace. <laughs> Said so the same grace that got you in here. I'll say amen. Amen. Now the last faith builder is we have to have the faith in the right principle. Look in verse 16 and 17. Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though, listen, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Stop. Now who does that verse remind you of? Richard Duncan. The last 10 plus years, his body was broken. His outward man was perishing. His son taking care of him. But what about the inward man? Oh, my stars. Growing, feeding on God's Word, sharing it. That's the picture of it. You said, but, but David, he passed away. Oh, it's not over. Look. Look. Being renewed day by day, for, look, 17, for our light affliction. When Almighty God looks down here and He sees he's, he's the most, and, and I don't mean to be, but the, 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 the worst case scenario of somebody's health, the worst case tragedy you can imagine, 
God says, it's a light affliction. Why? Read the rest of the verse. It is but for a moment. It is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now, how, what does that look like? We have the outward and the inward. See, having faith in the right principle is, is the code of conduct that we operate by. So how, what, how do we operate by? We operate by grace, back up in verse 15. And we're, we're, we're clinging to God. We know the outward man is perishing. The inward man is being renewed day by day. We understand that this is just a light affliction. It's, this is nothing lasts forever. I had a... Two grandsons, and, and I, I completely lost my mind, and I bought a four-wheeler. And um, the oldest one, he was, he was pretty good on it. He was careful somewhat, and, you know, and, 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 but then the younger one, he got on the four-wheeler. And he would go so fast down the side, of, and one time he was looking behind him, waving at his friends, and he ran into an air conditioner, but, you know, that's grandson. And another time he ran into my door going into my shed and put dents in it, I'm thinking, you know. But whenever you come around the side of the house, you hear him coming. If you're coming around the side of the house, you need to just get up in the flower bed and get out of the way. When he would come around, as soon as he hit the corner, he would turn that thing. And he'd, he'd, he'd drift. He'd slide it. And I had, a, I had a, it was like a big rut right there in all four corners of my house because he was making those laps. And my daughter said, Dad, what about your yard? I said, nothing lasts forever. I pray every morning the Lord would blow that four-wheeler up. No, I did not. <laughs> Lord, please. Like flat tires up. I said, this is not, not going to last forever. Now, let me say, this life is not going to last forever. But if your faith is everything in this life, if you're living for the next experience, if you want to have a good experience, a better experience, you know, and, and this is not wrong. We, we pray for healing, yes, but we should also pray for God's will be done. Because it says, for our light affliction is but for a moment. This life is just for a moment compared to eternity. He says, he says it is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now, I told Bob, I said, we're going to close with Octavius Winslow. <laughs> Get ready, because you, you got to listen to it. I had, to, I had to do it twice today. Number one, our light affliction. What is it working for? For us, What is it working in us? Number one, it would be the glory of perfect knowledge. The glory of perfect knowledge. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Perfect knowledge. When we get to heaven, this is part of the glory. What an orb, this is, this is Winslow, what an orb of intellectual light will be each glorified mind. What capacity of understanding will it develop? What range of thought it will compass? All mysteries unraveled. All problems then be solved. All discrepancies then be reconciled. Then we will know God and Christ and truth and providence and ourselves even as we are now known. Perfect knowledge. Secondly, it will be the glory of perfect holiness. The kingdom within us will then be complete. The good work of grace will then be perfected. It will be the consummation of holiness, the perfection of purity. No more sin, the conscience, no more sully, the thoughts, no more defiled, the affections, no more ensnared, but a glory of holiness, dazzling and resplendent, beyond an angels, revealed in us. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Amen. The glory of perfect happiness. The completeness of Christ is the completeness of moral purity. With reverence, it is spoken. Listen, God himself could not be perfectly happy if he were not perfect, a perfectly holy being. The radiance of the glorified countenance of the saints will be the reflection of holy thoughts and holy feelings that are glowing from within. Joy and peace and full satisfaction will beam in every feature because every faculty and feeling and emotion of the soul will be in perfect unison with the will of God and perfect assimilation to His image. Lastly, it will be a glory revealed in us. It's the glory of the Father's adoption, the glory of Christ's atonement, the glory of the Spirit's regeneration will radiate from a poor fallen son of Adam, a sinner redeemed, renewed, and saved. With suffering and glory thus placed side by side, Winslow says, Thus contrasted and weighed. To what conclusion does our apostle arrive? He writes in Romans 8, 18, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared 
with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I close with this. Mrs. Winslow. So do we weigh them? What comparison has the weight of the cross with the weight of the crown? Which one is the lightest? One second of glory will extinguish a lifetime of suffering. What were the, the long years of toil, sickness, when weighed with one drop of the river of pleasure at Christ's right hand? One breath of paradise, one wave of heaven's glory, one embrace of Jesus, one sight of God? To dwell in the bosom of Jesus, to see God, to be perfectly holy, to be supremely happy. Wait, my soul, before long it will all be revealed. Glory to God. Amen. 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 Let me encourage the family. You have been gifted an incredible legacy, an incredible inheritance, and you are living it. Bob, continue to study, know God's Word, and share God's Word. Miss Jane, you're, you're a walking, walking Bible concordance. And your travels are just amazing, and I'd love to hear your stories. And Miss Rachel, sweet as ever, she told me this morning, when I get to heaven, I'll be able to see. Glory to God. Glory to God. And all the things she's going to see. The ugliness that's on this crazy earth. There won't be any in heaven. My little girl. There won't be any in heaven. There won't be any in heaven. So let me encourage those of you who knew our brother. Let's take up his mantle. When Elisha. When he was taken to heaven in that fiery chariot. I'm sorry. Elijah was taken to heaven. Elisha prayed for a double portion of his spirit to be upon him. Elisha prayed that. May there be a double portion of the good grace and the good spirit that the Lord put upon Richard Duncan, may it fall upon us so that we might continue. Even though the outward man perishes, the inward man is growing day after day after day. You see, that's a discipline that we have to do. God will not do that for us. We have to do it. It's a discipline of the heart. It's a discipline of the mind. It's a discipline of our love. Jesus first. Jesus only. Jesus ever. Amen? Amen. Brother, won't you come and lead us that last song? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Hymn number 343. 343. Would you stand with me as we sing the first, the second, the fourth, and the fifth? grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I was was lost but now am found was blind but now I see was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me Shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Thank you. Let me encourage.
encourage you to stay in touch with the Duncan family. Card, letter, visit, greatly encourage them. And, and wait till the Lord prompts you because it's amazing. If we all do it at once, then it's kind of overwhelming. But as the Lord spaces it out, it always comes at the right time. Always at the right time. Amen? All right, let's close in prayer. Our Father, we come tonight in Jesus' name. A name that we've read about. A person that we love and study. And one day, Lord, we'll see him face to face. Our brother has gone on ahead. He's seen Jesus. And the moment he saw him, he probably said something profound like, it was all worth it. I don't remember any of the, the health issues. I don't remember any of that. For the glory of God. Father, I ask that you would take us, take your word. I pray, Lord, that we would allow it to mold us and shape us for these days that we're living in. Lord, that we can be effective in our witness. We could stay close in our fellowship with you. Lord, we would make ourselves available. Lord, that you can send us to do anything for the glory of God. Lord, watch over the Duncan family. Pray that you'd meet their needs. Lord, help us to encourage them, Lord, in, in ways that you will lead us in the days ahead. And thank you for the sure hope we have in Christ, in Christ alone. For we ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.